today we will look at one more important pattern of organization that is argument. So, an argumentative paper takes position on an issue which may have many angles to it, many sides to it. So, it attempts to convince a reader to accept an opinion, take some action or sometimes do both. So, this informed position which an argumentative paper takes is arrived at after exploring the issue in detail, considering multiple perspectives on it and then building a strong line of argument. So, an argumentative paper may support a previously established decision, course of action or theory, something which has already been proposed by others or it may reject previous views, opinions and put forth something new. Sometimes it may establish a common ground after considering multiple and opposing views. So, one of the three possibilities can happen with regarding um, an argumentative paper. Here, what we need to note is that some topics are not arguable. For example, personal preference or taste say um, if you ask me is red prettier than blue, then I would not be able to argue uh, either against or for it. Uh, if you like blue better than red, then you know you simply like it, you cannot you know have an argument about it. Then second thing is facts. So, there are some things which are well established, which are accepted universally. For example, India is the largest democracy at least till now in terms of population. So, this is a fact you cannot debate. Similarly, the earth revolves around the sun, this has been very well established. So, this is a fact. So, you cannot you know simply say no it is wrong, earth does not revolve around the sun. If you say something then you need to come up with very strong evidence and um, uh, supports for your argument, but that is not likely to happen. Then, so we can argue when there is some scope for disagreement, when there are multiple perspectives on a particular issue. Say for example, what needs to be done to increase job opportunities in India. So, then one person may say invest more in agriculture, because agriculture has been the primary occupation and therefore, so if you invest more, if you focus more on agriculture, it will create more job opportunities. Some other may argue no. Uh, agriculture cannot create too many job opportunities and uh, with uh, advancements in technology, uh, the actually we do not need too many people there. So, instead we need to invest in services sector, it is an expanding area and hence that is where we need to focus on. So, there you have an argument. So, uh, two persons here taking two different positions on the same issue and they have two different lines of argument. So, in such cases we can have an argument. So, it is not just enough to take a position on something. So, that position we have already observed should be an informed position. So, what does it mean? It means you have some basis to arrive at that particular point. You have some evidence, some 
you know kind of support to reach a conclusion on a particular issue. So, there are mainly three kinds of you know uh, uh, supporting evidence for arguments. They are called rational appeal, emotional appeal, ethical or moral appeal. So, what are these? First one you know rational appeal, you analyze reasons and available evidence to reach conclusions which are logical. Emotional appeal, so what happens here? Here you arouse strong emotional responses to make your readers agree with you or you persuade them to do something. Third one ethical or moral appeal, here you have at least you show that you have a genuine concern for the topic. So, commitment to truth and respect for others in and you say that whatever you are saying is in public interest. So, as a result of it you expect people to agree with you and do something. So, let us look at each of these three kinds in detail. The first one rational appeal. So, let us look at this example. However, although private final demand output and employment have indeed been growing for more than a year, the pace of that growth recently appears somewhat less vigorous than we expected. Notably, since stabilizing in mid 2009, real household spending in the United States has grown in the range of 1 to 2 percent at annual rates, a relatively modest pace. Households caution is understandable. Importantly, the painfully slow recovery in the labor market has restrained growth in labor income, raised uncertainty about job security and prospects and damped confidence. So, this is an extract from speech by uh, Ben Bernanke, who was um, the president of uh, US Federal Bank um, in 2010. So, here if you look at the crux of this argument, pace of growth is less than what is expected. So, that is you know 1 to 2 percent growth in real household spending. So, this is the main statement that growth rate has not been as expected. So, is it just a statement? No, there is actually evidence, uh, statistical you know support for it. So, um, this growth has been slow because labor market has been slow to recover and that has led to slow increase in income, uncertainty about job security and low confidence. So, in rational appeal you use reasons to defend your conclusions. So, these reasons are substantiated by evidence and evidence can actually fall into several categories. So, what are these? First one established truths. So, as we saw earlier these are facts and you cannot easily you know contest any of these things, because these have been well established and have been accepted. So, for example, historical fact India became independent on August 15, 1947. So, we have uh, documentary evidence and you cannot dispute it. So, this is a historical fact. Scientific fact the layer of ozone in the earth's upper atmosphere protects us from the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation. So, this again has been proved after many studies and so this again you cannot dispute. Geographical fact Andaman and Nicobar islands are volcanic islands. 
So, this again has been um, reached, this conclusion has been reached after studies and so now you cannot dispute it. So, you can use such well established facts may be historical, scientific, geographical to support your argument. So, for example, you are argue, you are arguing say you need to cut the use of CFCs. Why? You can use this fact that ozone is important, it plays an important role. It, so, going back to it, it you know, protects us from the sun's harmful ultraviolet radiation. So, therefore, uh, this is important thing and chlorofluorocarbon uh, emissions are damaging it. So, you have uh, studies to prove it. So, therefore, you can argue that we need to cut CFCs. So, using established truths, uh, we can um, argue for something or argue against something. Second is opinions of authorities. You can use these also to strengthen your argument. So, an authority is a recognized expert in the field. So, researchers, people respond in uh, people in responsible positions at reputed institutes or people who have got peer recognition means they have published they are considered as experts in their respective fields. So, you can quote these experts to argue for something or argue against something. So, for example, in our previous class, we looked at this text uh, on uh, effects of global warming. So, we saw there that the writer quotes an expert to say that global warming is affecting wildlife and it is going to increase death rate among human beings and it is also going to lead to weird weather patterns and therefore, the cost of management will increase. So, for each of these points, the writer quotes an expert to strengthen the line of argument. However, regarding authorities, we need to be beware, you know, biased opinions. So, audience should accept whoever we quote as an authority. And uh, the thing which we need to keep in mind is what we call conflict of interest. For example, say you are arguing that soft drink is not harmful to health and in order to support your argument, you are quoting uh, a CEO of a soft drink company. So, obviously, here is conflict of interest. So, the CEO of a soft drink company obviously will say that soft drink is not harmful. So, in this context, such you know uh, a quoting is not a good evidence. People do not accept such kind of persons as an authority in this context. So, people who you quote should have credibility and should have been you know accepted as an authority in that particular field. Next thing is primary source. So, documents or other materials produced by individuals involved with the issue or conclusions you reached. Say for example, you, you are making a claim about the press coverage of Malaysian Airlines flight disappearance, then you would want to read newspaper and magazine accounts of correspondents and uh, people who are directly involved in this. So, you need to consult people who are directly involved with the issue. Statistical findings. So, how much, how many, how often. 
So, this status sticks you can find in newspapers, magazines, books, reports and so on. Sometimes you may need to conduct your own investigation and then you find some stats. For example, so let us say you are investigating the efficacy of a particular teaching method. So, you have used two groups for one group you have used the traditional method say you have used um, grammar teaching uh, explicit grammar teaching techniques. The other group you have used your own uh, method which you know focuses on communicative aspects of language. So, at the end of your intervention say at the end of about 3 months you conduct a post test. You have conducted a pre test before your intervention. Now, you get statistics from your tests. So, now you compare pre test scores with those of post test and with the help of that you can come to some conclusion. So, here you have conducted your own investigation and that has given you some statistics and using that you make a claim. In such cases few precautions you need to make sure that your sample size is not too small. Say you are conducting a survey uh, regarding you know the mobile phones and you want to find out which brand is most popular among college students. So, your target population here is college students. So, now when you choose sample you have to be careful. If you select very limited sample say from a metropolitan city and students from you know higher economic uh, status, then you will get one particular kind of result. If you go to rural areas and uh, collect data, then you may get something else. So, the sample size has to be appropriate and the sampling also has to be appropriate. Then you cannot push statistical claims too far and uh, you need to be um, you know be, uh, be aware of biased statistics. Note here sometimes statistics you can interpret in any way you want. So, uh, you cannot make too general claims or too strong claims. Okay. Next kind of evidence you know is personal experience. Say your topic is you want to argue against uh, you know, chemical waste dumps. You can use personal stories of people who have lived near such waste dumps and have suffered from the consequences. So, such personal experiences, anecdotes uh, they can be used. However, they can reinforce in many contexts and they themselves alone cannot be used as evidence. You may need to use other kinds such as those which we have discussed uh, now like you know well established rules, uh, opinions of experts, statistical findings and so on to strengthen your argument. So, next thing is once you have collected different kinds of evidence, different pieces of evidence you need to evaluate them before using them. For example, say unfortunately you were involved in a train wreck, but based on that you cannot argue that trains are dangerous and people should not travel by trains. So, that will not be accepted. So, you have a personal experience yes, but can it help you make such a strong claim. So, that is 
why we say you need to evaluate the kinds of evidence you have before you reach a particular conclusion. So, how do you evaluate the evidence you have? So, some questions we need to ask ourselves are here, how credible are the sources of the information? How reliable is the evidence? Say, there is a report about you know decreasing number of tigers. So, this report has been produced by a government agency. So, then it is more reliable. If it is done by amateurs, then probably it is less reliable. So, the source of information is very important. So, you consult a journal article. So, that is definitely more reliable than an article which has appeared in a popular magazine. So, uh, this is what we mean by you know the credibility of the source of information. Next, how much confirming evidence is there? So, here we are talking about the quantity. So, for example, one authority who claims that global warming is a reality becomes more credible when that same thing is confirmed by several other people. But if only one person says no global warming is just a myth, then it is not highly reliable it may be just that one person's opinion. So, uh, the number here is uh, significant and uh, this is how you know things which originally started as you know opinions or one point of view have become well established facts. For example, uh, in the beginning uh, when uh, Galileo said that actually the earth revolves around the sun. So, that was actually one person's opinion, but later on it got confirmed and many people accepted it and now it has become a fact. Instead, if it is only one person's opinion and others do not agree with it, then it is not very reliable. Next, how much contradictory evidence is there. So, I make a claim. So, if there is a very obvious contradictory evidence, then my claim does not hold good. So, for example, if I now say that no, no it is wrong actually earth does not revolve around the sun, it is actually the sun which goes around the earth, then do I have evidence? Um, on the other hand, I have so much contradictory evidence and that will make my line of argument fall. For example, if some studies support vitamin supplements while some others point out the, their harmful effects, then we need to weigh both the sides more carefully before uh, making some claim about uh, this kind of you know uh, supplements. So, you need to weigh in the contradictory evidence. Then, how well established is the evidence? So, extremely well established evidence, you know, they, it becomes basis for textbooks and are assumed in most research. So, for example, the world started with a big bang. So, this has been kind of now accepted and we study these things in school textbooks as well. However, further research may change it. A classic example is the status of Pluto. Uh, uh, earlier in schools, we were taught that there are 9 planets in the solar system. So, that was actually very well established till some years back, when scientists re looked at the evidence and then they demoted uh, the status of Pluto. So, uh, uh, further research may change it, but some things are well established and are accepted and they become part of textbooks and you know it is assumed for further things uh, in many studies. 
Next, how well does the evidence actually support or fit a claim? Say for example, you are arguing for very favorable immigration policy in the US. So, you want to say that immigrant should be allowed into the US. So, in order to argue for this, can you use this particular piece of information that most Americans are immigrants or descendants of immigrants. So, this is actually a fact, but can you use that now to argue for know allowing more immigrants to come into the US. So, that is the question. So, you may have some evidence. So, the question is does it actually support your claim or does it fit into your line of argument. Otherwise, that evidence has no role. We will analyze actually some arguments and then we see that though visibly there is some evidence for the argument. A close analysis shows that there is actually no connection between the evidence and the claims and therefore, the claim actually collapses. Next, what does the evidence actually allow you to conclude? So, the question here is have you inferred it logically? and it is not an exaggerated conclusion. So, you have evidence on the basis of that you come to some conclusion. So, that connection is it logical. So, for example, TV violence and then you know, because of that children play more aggressively, but then can you say that it causes children to kill others. So, because of violence on TV, know can you say that children are actually tending to kill others more and more these days. So, that would be a very far fetched conclusion. So, you can only take it to some like extent. So, whatever you know is logically possible. If you extend too much then your argument collapses. So, how you reach conclusions from evidence? There are two methods induction and deduction. So, we will look at uh, these things in detail. So, in induction we move from specific to general like you have specific evidence and using that you make a more general claim. For example, many students who have done this course have got good jobs therefore, this course is good. So, student x has got a good job, student y has got it, student z and so on. So, based on those individual cases you are making the general claim that this course is good. Let us look at one more ma example. There is change in marks of the control group after this intervention. So, this teaching method is effective. So, when you are saying control group, you have many students there. So, student A, student B, student C. So, there is change in marks of these students and therefore, this teaching method is effective. So, you have individual cases, you have specific evidence and then using that you make a more general claim. So, this is sometimes called a bottom up approach. So, researcher here begins with specific observations and findings, then detects patterns and regularities, formulate some tentative hypothesis to explore and finally, make some general conclusions. So, based on individual examples, individual instances. Deduction on the other hand moves from general theory to specific instance. So, some general theory is there, it has been accepted and that you apply to individual case. 
So, a specific conclusion follows logically from some initial premises, you know, assumptions, beliefs about which people usually agree. So, let us look at an example. For a profitable career, good education is necessary. So, this is a general premise usually agreed upon. For a good education, students must study hard. This is again general premise and this is related to the first one. So, now based on these two, therefore, if my friend wants a good career, he she must study well. So, you have reached this specific conclusion based on these two premises. So, you have moved from general to specific. In deduction, sometimes it is also called reductio ad absurdum means to reduce to absurdity. So, you question a position by showing that its consequences are problematic if carried out to their logical end. So, if you do not impose any restrictions on people's right to bear arms, such a policy would allow individuals to own AK 47s, cannons and nuclear bombs. So, using a general theory, you know you show that if you take it to its uh, you know logical end, it would be disastrous. So, this kind of you know line of argument you can use to strengthen your position. Another thing related to deduction is called syllogism. So, you have a set of three statements that follow a fixed pattern. Let us look at an example. No dogs have feathers. So, this is a major premise. So, this is agreed upon. Spot is a dog. So, this is a minor premise. So, based on these two things, now you reach the conclusion. Therefore, spot does not have feathers. So, set of three statements that follow a fixed pattern, this is called syllogism. This kind of uh, you know task you often find in competitive exams. So, let us look at some syllogisms and see if the conclusion reached is logical and valid. The first example, all singers are happy people. Mary Harper is a singer. Therefore, Mary Harper is a happy person. So, let us look at the major premise. It says, all singers are happy. So, like you know you draw two circles, one representing singers, the other representing happy people. So, they are there is complete absolute overlap. So, all singers are happy people. Now, Mary Harper is a singer. So, so now Mary Harper, if you represent her with a dot, so you will put it inside that circle, uh, you know, uh, which is actually a kind of overlap between two circles, singers and happy people. So now. Mary Harper is a happy person. So, now this holds good. So, this conclusion is logical. Let us look at the second one. All cats like meat, Towser likes meat. Therefore, Towser is a cat. So, here this syllogism, see how it works. So, one all cats like meat. So, if you draw something like two circles. So, so this is you know cats and then all cats like meat. So, this meat would be larger thing. So, all cats circle it comes here. So, Towser could be anywhere here, it could be here or somewhere here, here, here. So, it means Towser could be a cat, it may not be a cat as well. So, this conclusion is not logical and it is problematic. So, this is how we examine syllogisms and decide whether the conclusion reached is logical or not. 
Next thing is analogy. So, we compare two unlike situations or things. Then on the basis of that, we uh, reach some conclusion. For example, medicines are tested on rats, because it is assumed that humans respond to chemicals as rats do. So, there is some kind of similarity assumed between rats and human beings. So, medicines are first tested on rats. So, conclusions rest upon observations about some different things. So, here efficacy of a particular drug depends on how you know it has worked with rats. So, some experts say this is weakest form of rational appeal. So, say you are going to implement a new economic policy. So, if you say this has worked in country x, so therefore, it will work for us. So, that is a kind of analogy and we know that may not uh, always be true. So, this is a weakest form of rational, this is the weakest form of rational appeal. Okay. So, all these things what we saw, these things are related to a rational appeal. So, we started with uh, looking at what kinds of evidence are available and then um, how we evaluate the evidence available to us, then how we reach uh, some particular conclusion based on the evidence we have. So, we looked at induction, deduction, syllogisms, analogy, all these things. So, uh, if you uh, uh, recall, in the beginning we listed three kinds of uh, you know appeals. So, the things what we saw, these things are related to a rational appeal. So, we started with uh, looking at what kinds of evidence are available and then um, how we evaluate the evidence available to us, then how we reach uh, some particular conclusion based on the evidence we have. So, we looked at induction, deduction, syllogisms, analogy, all these things. So, if you uh, recall in the beginning, we listed three kinds of uh, you know appeals. So, the all those things were related to rational. Now, we move to the second one that is emotional appeal. Here, you appeal to emotions of your readers, your audience. So, emotional appeal can actually lend powerful reinforcement. People may accept a logical argument, but if you want them to take some specific action, then you know, this may be more effective. For example, organizations usually raise funds to fight famine by displaying pictures of skeletal children. So, this you know is a kind of very a powerful emotional appeal. Emotion charged stories or pictures to solicit support for environmental movements, this also happens quite often. Now, let us look at an example. This is um, taken from uh, the very famous speech by Martin Luther King, I have a dream. Let us look at it in detail. I am not unmindful that some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells and some of you have come from areas where your quest, quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of pers persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. Continue to work with the faith that unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, go back to the slums and ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. So, here as you might have observed, Martin Luther King is urging African Americans to continue their struggle for equal rights for freedom. So, 
how is this done? This is basically done by appealing to emotions. So, if you look at this part, this refers to their uh, uh, trials and tribulations. You know, some of you have come fresh from narrow jail, so acknowledging their condition and um, you know, left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. So, this thing is you know um, uh, shows the, uh, the police brutality against these activists. Um, and then, if you look at the end of it, there is a very strong reinforcement, very positive um, note. Somehow, this situation can and will be changed. So, this use of uh, model verbs here uh, is very significant. So, this is a good example of emotional appeal. Let us look at one more example. So, I mentioned that uh, many times environmental organizations use photographs to appeal to people to take some definitive action. So, this is one such example. This is you know as you can see a picture of mother polar bear with her cup and it says please do not kill my mommy. And then there is another tagline they save a life before it is too late. So, we know that because of global warming polar ice is melting and it is threatening polar bears. So, if you give statistics about rising temperature and you know effect of temperature on ecology there. So, that would be rational appeal. But here you are using a photograph, a cute um, polar bear cup. So, this actually appeals to emotions of readers. So, as mentioned, a rational appeal may convince your readers, but they may not take any action. Here, you know, probably you want them to adopt green way of life or make some donations to save polar bears. So, if you want them to act on a particular issue, then uh, emotional appeal uh, may be more effective. So, continuing uh, the third and the final one is ethical or moral appeal. So, here you show genuine concern for the topic you commit to truth and respect for others, you, you intend to um, show that whatever you are doing is in public interest. So, it is used to establish the writer as a fair, open minded, community minded, moral honest person. So, you are here appealing to general public. So, note here that every culture has some values, which are considered as uh, good ones. So, every culture you know um, uh, wants to preserve those values and um, gives very high uh, you know status to such things. So, by using those things, by appearing to be you know a strong supporter of such values you can you know argue for something or against something. So, let us look at an example. So, this is speech uh, an extract from speech by Bill Clinton. Before I go on, I would like to take just a moment to thank my own family and to thank the person who has taught me more than anyone else over 25 years about the importance of families and children. A wonderful wife, a magnificent mother and a great first lady. Thank you, Hillary. So, here Bill Clinton you know, by uh, thanking his wife and acknowledging her contributions, here is uh, comes off as a sensitive family man. So, this is a kind of you know value, which many people believe is 
good one which, and they think that people should have it. So, you should acknowledge the contributions of your spouse and you know um, in public place. So, that is considered as a virtue and so by doing so here Bill Clinton comes off as a sensitive family man. Let us look at uh, one more example. So, if you are making a claim that you know health insurance should be available to all people under 21. So, this is your line of argument. So, what is evidence for it? So, you are using ethical appeal here and you say that children are most vulnerable in our society and we have a moral obligation to protect them. So, therefore, health insurance is mandatory for you know people under 21. So, this is a kind of ethical appeal you are using here. So, summing up you know we have looked at three kinds of appeals rational, emotional and ethical or moral. So, rational appeal means you use available evidence, you use experts opinions, statistical findings uh, to support your argument. Ethical appeal um, you, uh, you know appeal to what is considered good in a society. You use values of the society which are considered you know, real virtues. Emotional appeal, you appeal to emotions of people you want particularly in, in some cases to uh, you know encourage people to take some definitive action. So, you can use these depending on your topic, depending on your purpose and depending on context. So, for example, uh, academic context you are writing a research paper, then you may not um, find emotional appeal and ethical appeal very appealing. You there you need to use rational appeal. Say you are talking, you are addressing a, a group of people, then you know you may think of emotional appeal or ethical appeal. So, the next aspect you know is what we call logical fallacies. So, what are these? So, these are errors in reasoning. So, you have some evidence and you reach some conclusion. So, kind of errors you make in reasoning you know are called logical fallacies. These will undermine your argument these will weaken your argument. Let us look at some very common logical fallacies. First one is called hasty generalization. So, as the name you know itself suggests you reach a conclusion based on insufficient or biased evidence. In other words you are rushing to a conclusion before you have all the relevant facts. You have purposefully uh, omitted them or you are you know not just aware of those things. Uh, for example, so you are attending say a particular course and it is the first day and um, you uh, come to the conclusion that this course is going to be boring. So, this is an example of hasty generalization, because um, in the very first class the instructor may actually have um, discussed many housekeeping things like course policies, assessment practices and so on. So, based on just one experience if you reach the conclusion that this course is boring, this instructor is boring then this is hasty generalization. Next one, post hoc ergo propter hoc. So, it means it assumes that if A has occurred after B, then B must have caused A. This we have looked at 
when we were discussing cause effect analysis as well. So, for example, I drank a bottled water and now I am sick. So, the water must have made me sick, but uh, you may have you know uh, drank contaminated water two days back or you may have got that disease from somebody else in a public place. So, uh, you do not um, think about those things, you look at only the thing which has immediately preceded. So, you blame uh, that particular factor. So, this is what we call post hoc ergo proctor hoc. Next one is called slippery slope. It means, so there is a premise that if A happens, then you know there will be chain reaction and eventually through a series of small steps, uh, you know from A you move on B, C, D, E, F until you know Z. So, if you do not want Z to happen, A itself should be prevented. Okay. Let us look at this example. If we implement odd even policy today to reduce the pollution, eventually the government will ban all cars. So, we should not implement odd even policy. So, this is what you have now at the moment odd even policy and you assume that. So, if this is extended, then government will ultimately ban all cars completely. So, if you do not want that to happen, we should not let this thing ha happen that you know odd even policy. So, this is you know what we call slippery slope. Next is either or. So, this is as you know the name suggests, this is oversimplification of the issue. So, you say that this particular issue has only two positions and you have to take only you know one of those two. Okay. So, look at this example, we can either stop bursting crackers or destroy the earth. So, you are arguing against the use of crackers. So, we know that crackers may lead to pollution, sound pollution, air pollution and so on but uh, it is a complex thing and um, there is no conclusive evidence, but if you do oversimplification and you know you now you have reduced it only to two options. So, you are asking your readers either to stop bursting crackers or destroy the earth, but we know there are many intermediate positions many possibilities there as well. Next is straw man. So, this is also oversimplification. So, you actually oversimplify your opponent's viewpoint and then you attack that particular argument. Look at this example people who do not support the proposed state minimum wage increase hate the poor. So, you are taking it to kind of personal level. So, you are say you know arguing for um, minimum wage increase and you know there are some people who are not supporting it, but you actually overlook the fact that the people who are opposing it may be doing so for various reasons. You do not consider those and you say they are doing so just because they hate the poor. This is a, a highly oversimplification and you are using it to attack your um, opponents. So, this is also a, a fallacy. Next is circular argument. So, we know that if you have some argument you need evidence for it, but what happens in circular argument is you keep on restating the same thing again and again may be paraphrasing it putting it in different words, but basically you are saying the same thing again and again. 
um, so this does not prove anything. So, look at this example, John is a good communicator because he speaks effectively. Now, what is definition of a good communicator? One of those things is you know speaking effectively. So, basically you are reiterating the same thing in different words. Probably you need to say John is a good communicator, because he can um, communicate with people from diverse backgrounds. So, then that is a kind of support for your argument, but this is definitely not support for this argument. Next is begging the claim. So, here the conclusion that the writer should prove is validated within the claim. So, you have already assumed that you know, that is true. So, look at this example, filthy and polluting coal should be banned. So, this is your argument, but you have already assumed that you know coal is filthy and it pollutes. So, the first point should be you know coal pollutes. So, that is your statement and then you should have some evidence to support it. And uh, then you can say that because it is polluting coal should be banned, but you have already you know uh, assumed that this conclusion has already been reached. Red herring. So, this is a diversionary tactic that avoids key issues and you know um, uh, avoids opposing arguments rather than addressing them. Uh, look at this example, the level of mercury in seafood may be unsafe, but what will fishers do to support their families? Say you are talking about banning seafood and you are arguing against it. Now, instead of that thing you have brought in another topic here about fishers. So, um, this is you know called rod red herring, you have avoided the main thing you are arguing uh, you know uh, based on something else. something related to that is you know genetic fallacy. So, this conclusion is based on an argument that the origins of a person, idea, institute or theory you know uh, determine its character. So, for example, see my doctor is overweight. So, whatever he says about staying healthy is not trustworthy. So, you are making a, a statement here that whatever my doctor says is not trustworthy. So, then what is your basis? Your basis is not actually you know stats or even personal experience, this is completely you know what is what we call genetic fallacy. Because your doctor is overweight, you are saying that uh, whatever um, he says about staying healthy is not trustworthy. So, we will uh, stop here um, our discussion on argument and we will continue in the next class. Thank you.